Good afternoon, everybody. Can you take your seats or stand and listen, whatever you feel like? It's always the MPWS ones, isn't it? Um, I hope you enjoyed lunch and had a good chat. Uh, lots of things to consider from this morning, which was really excellent. Um, we'll get on with this afternoon and we're going to kick off um, with a pre recorded presentation on concrete reintroduction uh, along a journey from Chrissy Kelly of the Pensthorpe Conservation Trust. Chrissy is head of species management at Pensthorpe and leads on, concrete, uh, on the concrete reintroduction project and the East of England Curlew Recovery Head Starting Programme amongst a whole lot of other stuff on, uh, on aviculture. So uh, we'll hear from Chrissy now. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Chrissy Kelly, and I'm Head of Species Management at Pencil Conservation Trust, which is a small conservation trust in North Norfolk. And I've been working with corncrakes for nearly two decades. Um, thank you very much for asking me to present and speak about the reintroduction trial which, uh, as the title suggests, has been a, a long journey. Um, and it's actually been quite a challenge to condense into 20 minutes. So I hope I can cover all the necessary points. Um, so today, the Concrete Reintroduction Project is a Natural England funded project in partnership with Con Pencil Conservation Trust, the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust, Zoological Society of London and the RSPB, members of which all sit on a strategic advisory group as well as Professor Rhys Green, whose knowledge and scientific input has really steered the project from, from the offset. So the corncrake is a red listed species in the UK and one of, uh, one of Britain's birds of conservation concern. The last paragraph of this summary relates to the project and I'm sure there'll be some further discussions around um, indicators of a successful reintroduction. So there are two areas of focus I'd like to cover today. Um, these are around the captive breeding management and chick rearing techniques, and then also around uh, release site habitat requirements and monitoring efforts of returning birds why release sites were chosen in the first place and the ongoing pressures of the success. So when the project began in 2002, the breeding group comprised of birds sourced from captive collections that had corncrakes um, originating in Germany and Poland at the time, they were brought to Whipsnade Zoo, where the breeding group was established and, the, and, and built up. The release site was chosen in the east of England after a feasibility of various, uh, various sites was carried out. Another important fact is that in 2005 and 2009, a license was given by Nature Scotland for a number of juvenile corncrakes to be caught, which were brought into the captive breeding programme. So these founding Scottish birds were initially integrated with the German Polish birds already in the programme, and uh, this was to boost the genetic um, diversity of the group. So the importance of genetic provenance of the captive breeding group was highlighted with studies over the years, which I'll chat about in a second. But the article here um, I've put up because it shows uh, the migration route uh, of the Scottish corncrakes from a study carried out by Rees in 2011 um, using geolocators fixed to the leg rings of male corncrakes caught on coal. And it shows that the Hebridean birds migrated down to West Africa and then across to the Congo in late November and December. Then on their return journey, they stopped briefly in West Africa in March and then they flew up back through Spain and stopped at Spain for a short time and returned to Scotland by late April, early May. There's been a lot of science around uh, the returning birds from the project um, with the catching and monitoring techniques. And the results that we were 
beginning to see from from this project was that birds from Scottish parents were four times more likely to return to the breeding to the release site than um, German and Polish birds. And even those birds uh, that were crossed between Scottish and Polish were, were still had a had a lower return rate than pure Scottish bred birds. So the decision was made in 2013 of the project to remove all um, all birds, all breeding birds that had uh, German or Polish um, genetics. Some details about the captive breeding techniques. Since 2017, uh, the captive collection has been managed solely at Pensorpe. Uh, we have 24 aviaries each eight foot by eight foot set with a central corridor. Now, housing facilities are the main limitation to the size of the breeding group, um, particularly when you're parent rearing and you have chicks for two weeks um, in addition to all the breeding birds. We currently have 11 males and 17 females in the breeding group uh, for 2024, but have had up to 20 breeding females in the past. You can see on the small picture on the right there, that's the uh, the winter facilities, which is essentially a shed um, with soft sand and lots of cover. Uh, the birds are caught up from here and health checked by a veterinarian before being um, put out into the breeding enclosures in spring. So in early April, uh, the corn quakes are paired in their summer ovaries. Each one is planted with a mix of nettles and established grasses. Corn quakes really like to nest under, under the grasses, but the nettles provide really early cover, so they feel secure. And a table is, uh, is provided in each pen uh, to provide shelter for the food, which often doubles as a calling post for the males. We leave the birds to settle for a couple of weeks and then start to look for nests. Then once a nest is found, we count the number of eggs. Now clutches can vary between four and 10 eggs. So by counting at an early stage before the clutch is complete, and then again, once the female is sitting, we can work out when, uh, when was the start of incubation. You know, corn crates will lay an egg each day. So by simple arithmetic, you can get quite an accurate uh, guide to when incubation started. The male needs to be uh, taken away from the female and he's caught up um, any time between five eggs being laid uh, the female will retain some sperm, so um, she will finish her clutch if he is removed um, or just after the female has started to incubate. If the male is left longer than 10 days after the start of incubation, especially early in the season, he's likely to disturb the nest. Incubation period is around 16 days. Um, and when the females, um, sorry, when the chicks were being hand reared, we'd allow the female to sit around 13 or 14 days before taking the eggs um, into the incubation in, into the incubator and finishing off the incubation and hatch the chicks uh, artificially. For hand rearing, uh, we'd use the small Brincy uh, incubators and then um, They'd be transferred into a, a hatcher. It can sometimes take a day or two to hatch. Um, always remained in their clutches, however, and then once the chicks had hatched, they'd be moved into a brooder uh, for, for hand rearing once they've uh, absorbed the yolk sac and fluff, fluffed up, which is you know within within a day. So the chicks were put into a brooder um, uh, in their clutches. Uh, hand rearing is very successful and a large number of chicks can be reared for release this, this way. We use puppet rearing technique, which is a brown sock for corn crakes and a spoon, as you can see from this video. Um, it's really important not to spend too much time with the chicks because they do imprint. Um, so we would feed them every hour uh, initially for the first two or three days um so again not as not to spend too much time 
that you can go back after an hour and some chicks that hadn't fed uh, one feed in would uh, hopefully come up uh, and feed at the next um, it was it was really successful So as not to um, imprint the corn crakes, we'd be hiding behind uh, curtains. And um, although hand rearing was successful, um, it does require a huge investment in time, staff, biosecure facilities. You need lots of brooders and and also lots and lots of cleaning. So it's it's very labour intensive, although successful. So by 2019, um, with pressures around cost and practicality of hand rearing requirements, we trialled parent rearing, and this was quite a big shift. Um, uh, and really, you know, we needed to see if it was possible to still reach target numbers of 100 chicks released every year by this method. Um, a lot of work had been done uh, around diet and nutrition and um, uh, and also disease risk management by this time. Um, so we, we thought we'd, you know, we'd potentially give it a good shot, but of course it takes a lot longer um, with that investment from the female in rearing the chicks for the first two weeks um, to to actually then just taking the eggs and her having another, another clutch of, of eggs. The diet of the corn crake chicks is, is really key. Um, we use Lundy, the Lundy pelleted diet and it works very well. The micro pellet can be soaked in supplemented water with Avipro and Avimix uh, and, and, and still hold a firm consistency. It can be sprinkled with calcium lactate so you can give, give the chicks anything that they need um, in those first two weeks. Uh, we, we actually give very little uh, live food um, so we can uh, we can make sure they're getting all the nutrients uh, required. Metabolic bone disease has been a, a, a an issue in the past, so um, uh, but we haven't seen that with parent rearing. And the other um, disease risk issue that we've had with any juvenile birds actually is uh, is coccidium burden. So the birds are treated. Um, in the water with Baycox, um, two days out of every seven, all the way through rearing, and that really keeps the coccidial burden low. It doesn't uh, destroy it, because we don't want that particularly, um, as there's coccidia everywhere, but it does uh, enable the chicks to be uh, to grow up really healthy. So at around 14 days old, the chicks are, are caught uh, out of the pen and they are given a health check by a veterinarian and a small drop of blood is collected for sexing. At this time, they're given a plastic ID ring so individuals can be traced back uh, all the way through. Uh, generally, they're kept in their, in their clutches, but no more than, than five uh, in each, from each clutch uh, will go into a pre-release pen at the release site. So they're transported in these carrier boxes and taken by car. Wellney um, is currently is about an hour's drive, about 56 kilometres from Pensthorpe. Uh, so that's where uh, they're being transferred to. So when they re uh, reach the release, uh, the release site, 
um, they're put into a one of a series of uh, of enclosures which are eight foot by 12 foot so a bit bigger than the breeding enclosures um, planted with nettles for instant cover they become very shy shy here which is what what you want um, but they'll continue to to grow here um, fed by the staff at the release site now again the the feeding of of the chicks at this stage is is vital because uh, you know corn crakes will always choose uh, live food over a pelleted diet um, and will quickly stop eating any of the pellets so so that's a really key fact and that transition from um, pelleted food to uh, live food is is really important the uh, all the live food is is got loaded with Nutri-Grub um, to ensure they've got enough uh, nutrients in them as well. So on release day, um, the corn crakes are caught out of their uh, pre-release pens, and there's a second vet health check by the Disease Risk and Health Surveillance Team at uh, Zoological Society of London. And at this stage, the plastic ID ring is exchanged for a metal BTO ring. So that um, identification can follow the individual all the way through. So most birds by 35 days are, are fully fledged and they've got good flight feathers. But yeah, somewhere over the years, it's been shown between 35 and 40 days is the best stage to release the birds into the wild. It's a busy day, uh, corn crates. We've got a team of BTO ringers and a team of vets, and it's become quite a, a, a slick operation. So it doesn't take very long. Um, and the birds are popped back into the bags and then um, transport, transported to the release fields. So the birds in the bags are transport, transported to the release field and then uh, the bag opened up. And, uh, and off they go. Um, and they'll remain uh, around uh, feeding and continuing to imprint on the, on the site that we want them to return to um, until they're ready to migrate, which is generally the end of August, uh, September time. So there have been um, three release sites in the course of the, uh, of the project. Uh, the first one uh, that you can see here is at the RSPB neem washes. <clears throat> and then this second site in the Wensum Valley uh, was considered in 2015 after interest from a local landowner near Pensthorpe. And it was done uh, with the understanding uh, that when target numbers were, were, were reached at the neem washes, the, the, the re remaining birds could be uh, released uh, in the Wensum Valley. And by this time, um, with uh, ZSL Whipsnade and Pensthorpe uh, rearing chicks, we were producing regularly well over 100 um, chicks for release each year. Um, and then the third site on the map here um, at WWT Welney um, began in, uh, that release trial began in 2021. Um, at the use washes at uh, the uh, in partnership with WWT. Now habitat of course is the all important factor and this aerial shot here shows a picture of the neem washes um, uh, in Cambridgeshire uh, and it's kind of an oasis in a, a barren intensively farmed landscape. Now, one of the factors um, considered in establishing this trial was um, how to get the corn crates to imprint well on the site and return the following year to the same area. So, you know, having this sort of oasis in a in in, in a sort of barren landscape um, was uh, was a, a factor considered that the birds at least would come back to that to that to that site and find each other. And mon monitoring efforts um, over the course of the trial at the Neen Washes um, showed good results. They had uh, returning birds uh, in similar numbers to the wild populations. That's around 20% of uh, migratory birds make it back. And actually, uh, by 2014, um, it, the results were, were really promising. 
um, with 22 calling males back here and seven of which were, um, when they were caught, didn't have um, a BTO ring on, which indicated uh, wild breeding the previous year. However, the following year, 2015 and 2016, um, didn't show uh, such sustained positive results and um, without these uh, results, RSPB decided to uh, pull out of the project as a release site in 2016. And with the RSPB pulling out, ZSL Whipsnade also decided um, that they had given the program uh, a, a, a good enough shot and withdrew as well. So the second release site at the Wensum uh, Valley did begin as a satellite project in you know partnership with the NEEN release, but with partner withdrawal, uh, Pencil Conservation Trust became the sole partner for operational management of the project. Now this was an interesting trial and one that demonstrated how important multidisciplinary partnership is. You know, a willing farmer isn't enough and the buy-in and real understanding of habitat requirements and management is vital. Um, for example, um, the, the farmer when we first started this project in 2015 had a small herd of 40 red pole cattle. By 2020, when it finished, um, they were 400 cows and obviously grazing um, management uh, took priority over corn crakes. Um, the picture here does show though the uh, the release pens uh, nestled um, in the landscape, uh, you know, where you, uh, the release site where you want them, want the birds to return. So during the course of the Wensum trial, we were successful in recent releasing large numbers of captive bred corn crakes, and it was at this stage we did trial um, parent rearing as well. The highest number released um, within the project was 166 in 2018, but the habitat wasn't right at the Wensum, and we saw a wide dispersal of returning birds. This made monitoring and catching corn crakes very challenging. You know, and monitoring, uh, monitoring returning birds is vital of uh, proof of success. Um, and the ca catching technique and monitoring is all done between 11 p.m. and 3 a.m. Um, uh, the birds are caught using a tape lure and, and a mist net. So this is hard enough in a, a small strip of fantastic habitat where there are uh, uh, 20 calling birds, let alone um, all over East Anglia. <laughs> So with the Wensum trial coming to an end um, and success um, not hugely um, positive at that time, there were discussions around uh, an exit plan and uh, Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust were approached to consider joining the partnership to release birds at their site at, uh, at Welney. And the reason behind this uh, was because birds from both the Neen Washes releases and the Wensum releases, which is 56 miles away, had returned to the Welney site. And there was also, from the monitoring results, proof of wild breeding. So this really brings us to present day. Um, the site at Welney is superb, although it is still prone to summer flooding, which can really affect productivity. Uh, and there is uncertainty over the future of the ongoing project. Although there's been lots of successes, we have yet to reach a sustainable population. New bloodlines required, Genetics can be managed within the captive population, but the relatedness of the returning birds is also of concern. So, you know, we are at a stage now where really, um, you know, information from this trial can be used uh, for future trials, or we need a, a, a bit of an injection of, uh, of input from new, new, new breeding stock and potentially other sites to release the birds. Well, thank you very much for listening. Um, I'll leave you with, with this. Uh, and this mail here was recorded at Welney last year. Beautiful song of the concrete. Thank you very much.
was great. Uh, John, can I just check, uh, is Chrissy online? Chrissy is online, if there's questions. Then. We'll take them at the end, yeah, that's great. Um, so moving from England, we'll move to uh, France, uh, and I'll introduce uh, Thibaut Cotineau and uh, Ryan Boswarthick, um, working uh, mutually for ICON and uh, LPO uh, in France on the uh, Anjou and Conservation uh, Action Project. So uh, over to you guys. Thank you. Okay, so sorry, I have trouble with the with the device. So anyway, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Thibaut Cotino. Um, I am part of uh, an association uh, called um, Initiative for the Conservation of Nature. And I've been part of the team uh, which has written uh, the National Plan of Actions for Concrete Conservation in France. And, uh, and hey everybody, uh, I'm Ryan Buzwaldik. Uh, I just started a PhD on concrete conservation at the LPO Anjou and uh, in collaboration with the uh, CNRS in Montpellier. Okay, so the National Plan of Action is a tool we use uh, uh, and which allow us um, budget uh, for species conservation for roughly 10 years. And, um, oops, sorry. And uh, to to be eligible to to, to a national plan of action, a species uh, has to to meet some criteria, uh, like extinction risk, risk related to population size, uh, natural habitat loss rate, and uh, population fragmentation uh, or rate of decline. And as you can see on this map and graphs. Uh, unfortunately, corn crakes meet all the criteria to be eligible for national plan of actions. So the situation can be compared to what have happened in the past in Ireland and Scotland. Um, in the beginning of uh, last centuries, corn crakes were found all around France and in big numbers. Uh, for example, for example, uh, in the early 80s, there were around uh, uh, 2,800 um, singing male concrete, and uh, until uh, until now, there has been a huge decline uh, in that population uh, due to the intensification of agriculture in France. And uh, until uh, 2015, uh, the numbers of uh, singing, singing male has declined all the time uh, to get around uh, 200 singing males. And from, for now, uh, we can count less than 100 singing male in France last year. So the situation is pretty dramatic, and there's only few population left all around the national territories. <clears throat> so as you can see, this is a map everybody know, I guess, here. We've already seen this map this morning, but this represents the distribution of concretes in Europe and the migration routes they used to go to West Central Africa for part of the population, probably the western part of concrete population, uh, going to central West Africa and the western uh, concrete population, uh, eastern, sorry, 
it's not easy for me to speak English. I'm a bit sorry. Um, so, and the eastern concrete population of Europe going down uh, to um, to South Africa uh, through Egypt and uh, and East Africa. So on the other end, you can see a map of France showing uh, and highlighting you the main spots where you can find coral cracks, where you can still find coral cracks, at, mis at least for now. Um, as you can see, there's two, two main habitats that they used in France. Uh, a kind of typical one, which is the, the, the meadows. Um, and... Uh, Another one which can be found in mid-mountain and probably be, can be the same situation as in Italy and Switzerland. Um, to give you a brief idea, um, the main population, the main stronghold where you can still find concrete in numbers in France is around Angers, at the west of France, where we, we could count around 50 singing males last year, and that is uh, representing around 70% of French population. The two other areas where you can still find a bit of corn cracks is um, on the southeast of France, uh, in the mid-mountain area around Nice, where there's still some of them, maybe around 10, 15 singing males last year, and uh, on the north of France, northwest of France, in Normandy, where we could found uh, around 10, uh, 10 birds, 10 singing males last year. So that's really fragmented population with small, um, with small amount of, any, uh, of birds, and that's really worrying. Um, on those pictures, you can see the typical habitat um, on the top, uh, which uh, correspond to um, uh, Les Basses Vallées Angevin, uh, which is the lower valley uh, around Angers. Uh, Angers sorry. Um, those places are flooded meadows, and um, this is really the stronghold where you can still find concrete in France um, with less agricultural pressure due to the weather conditions with a flooded, flooded area for at least early seasons. And um, on the other side, um, you have a typical landscape where we can find uh, concrete uh, in mid-mountain areas. So same here less agriculture pressure, so corn creeks can still have so enough cover to, to, to feel secure and to reproduce. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so our goal is to maintain or re-establish a French population at a stable conservation status. So, we have a medium long term strategy around 10 years for this national plan of actions. And um, this national plan of actions uh, includes stakeholders uh, at different levels. First, the Ministry of Environment in France is the one who is uh, in charge of it. And uh, it's uh, the Bird Protection Leagues which is the animate, animator, sorry, it's not easy for me after lunch. Uh, I'm sorry. Anyway, so the French Ministry of Environment uh, give the animation to the bird protection leagues uh, for this uh, national plan of actions. And uh, the bird protection league is then working locally with farmers and community to, to maintain and to protect corn creeks. So briefly, what has been done in the past in the France, um, we had a life project with land acquisition, habitat restoration, and other experimentation, uh, mainly with uh, new technologies, 
like uh, drones, bioacoustics, uh, and I guess the same almost everywhere. Uh, we are all trying things, um, but it's not easy. Um, um, a tool we are using uh, to protect uh, corn crakes is the classification such as uh, Natura 2000, uh, which help us to protect, um, uh, I'm missing words, I'm really sorry about that, uh, which help us protect uh, land and areas. And um, this, this give us legal, um, uh, it's terrible. I'm really, really sorry about that. Uh, sorry? Legal yes, of course, legal protection. Please come with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, where was I? I'm really lost. I'm really sorry. This is terrible. Uh, and the implementation of um, M. M A E C, which can be translated um, from uh, agro environment. Uh, it's not easy to pronounce this one. Huh? Agro environmental schemes and emergency measures, which is uh, a direct link and tools uh, we used with farmers uh, to have uh, efficient measures uh, to protect concretes. <laughs> And obviously, um, we are counting concrets uh, on the national territory. So there's two two main uh, two main dates um, in uh, in the beginning of the season around May, and a bit later in the season uh, around June. Uh, so those uh, countings are done every year and uh, are done all around France. Um, sorry. So, even though we are working on corn creeks since many years, the conservation, the conservation stat status rema remains really preoccupying. The situation, as you have seen a bit earlier, is really dramatic in France. We have not, not so many left, and if we don't act now, it will be too late. So, as this, as this conservation status is still bad in France, uh, we had uh, a PhD student, uh, Sumaya Bengali, who has done a terrific job on a bibliographic review, uh, which Ryan will speak about. Um, yeah, so as Thibaut said, uh, there's a really important international review that was done in 2021 by Sumaya Beglali. So it was on the current knowledge of the species and all the feedback that were at the international level on conservation measures. Uh, so it was done in collaboration with the CEF of, in Montpellier, so the CNRS and the LPO Anjou. And uh, it actually helped to first have an international synthesis of all what's been done on corn cracks, but also identify major knowledge gaps that could be useful to work on for the next 10 years and next national action plan. So it helps identify what we could work for, uh, work on, sorry. Um, so first there was the habitat selection that could be useful, because um, for now it's mainly focused on singing males as it's the easiest way and the best way to uh, detect corn cracks. There's also the question of um, studying more uh, female and chick behavior, because we know that if we help identify and know where females are, it could be really important in order to improve the breeding su success and at long term corn crake conservation. Uh, there's also the species movement that can be interesting to study uh, with all the interseasonal movements that, and dispersion that there is, but also all the site fidelity and also, important thing, all the movements that may occur during the same breeding season, because as we saw in the, um, in the reviews, there's a male, single male can move like a few hundred kilometers uh, during a single uh, breeding season. Uh, also, a question that we want to um, wanna, um, work on is all the wintering areas, because they're quite unknown for the French populations, but as we, of course, think that it's going to be the same as maybe in Scotland or in Ireland. And a quite important question that was at the end of this work was how could, we, how could we evaluate 
if a conservation measure is effective or not. So that was a big question that's got to be answer, answered in the next years. And so with this work, uh, the newest PNH, so National Action Plan, was uh, created. So it started in 2024 and it's going to last at least ten, for 10 years. And it's animated by the LPO France and by Justin Chambolin that's in the room. <laughs> And it mainly aims to improving knowledge to enhance conservation measures, but not only some knowledge, it's also some concrete actions on the field with stakeholders. So it's focusing on the knowledge, fa uh, knowledge factors, but also on the fields, uh, all the relations with the politics and also the stakeholders. And so for 10 years, there's a few actions that are planned. Uh, so in first, uh, first of all, there's uh, the PhD that um, we'll be doing on concrete conservation. This is the first important project of this new PNA. Uh, you've also got a post uh, PhD uh, position that's going to come out at the end of this summer, and it will be about, uh, about uh, modeling concrete future distribution in the meadows uh, in France and especially around Angers, where the main population is. There's also the question of ide identifying the wintering areas that will be done. Uh, by the ICON Association and maybe TIBO, so identifying where concrete uh, winds are in uh, Africa. And also there's a, uh, this project really wants to improve all of the international collaboration and um, have some um, collective actions with all the countries uh, and especially the West, uh, Western Europe countries. And so yeah, it really aims to reactivate a dynamic of international exchanges around concrete as we think it's really important to have an international vision of concrete conservation, as for example, mutualizing and sharing our knowledge on concretes, uh, working together on maybe challenging areas that could be, that could be useful, and uh, working together could be quite good in order to move forward uh, faster on these topics. And also, why not, it's only a hypothesis, but why not try to use the same protocols at the international level to, in order to uh, update the uh, concrete numbers, as it's often different between countries. And all of these uh, international levers could really help us use some, uh, be some more influence at the European level uh, in order to, uh, all that comes to protection measures and also mainly concrete conservation. So a quick word of what's gonna happen during my PhD. So I've got four main, um, four main objectives that quite complete themselves well. So we've got first the habitat use in optimal nesting site selection, population viability analysis, effectiveness of local conservation measures, and of course the wintering routes and wintering areas. And we'll be tagging, uh, for two of these objectives, we'll be tagging concrete. So we've already tried it once in captivity. Uh, so it was on the male concrete, we're gonna use only tail tags. And um, so um, the, the objective for 2024 is to tag at least six concretes this year. And if uh, the, uh, the, the method is quite good, we would improve these numbers in order to tag, um, tag uh, concretes more and more each year. That's it. So briefly, um, this map is showing uh, the job uh, which has been done by the Professor Green uh, about 10 years ago. Um, so we can see the migration route used by Concrex uh, going from uh, Scotland to, to, to West and Central Africa. Um, so with ICON Association, we have uh, an objective to go to Congo and uh, identify and characterize and characterize habitat in the wintering areas, evol evaluate the potential trait, develop partnership with local structure, and um, if possible, uh, catch some birds over there and uh, tag them and see if they come back in Europe. Uh, so this is just a project for now. Uh, we are talking with Professor Green to see uh, if we can do this and if he's okay with, uh, with that uh, project. But yeah, this is uh, probably work we're gonna do if we're lucky this winter or next winter. So yeah, basically that's, uh, that's it. So sorry about my accent. <laughs> Thank you. Merci, messieurs. 
c'est fini. <rire> um, thank you very much, gentlemen. That was fantastic. Um, and it shows the, the value of these collaborative studies. Uh, you know, okay, we've got some information, but these guys are right at the start of their, their own uh, 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 efforts into trying to find out what they need to do for their sites, uh, places we've been before and uh, will no doubt be again in future for other species. Um, and it's other species we move on to next, and I'd like to invite Mary McAndrew up from Acres West Connacht. Um, cooperation project, which uh, is the new national agri-environmental program here in Ireland under the CAP. Acre CP works in areas where corn crakes, amongst many other species and habitats, are targeted for protection and restoration on farmland. We have so many species in trouble, and you've got to balance them all. So uh, we'll hear from Mary. Thanks very much, um, everybody, and John for inviting me. Um, so when John gave me the title of my talk, Balancing Corn Creek and Other Priorities. I was kind of going, Jesus, what am I going to talk about? <laughs> but um, yeah, so I'm going to start off by just explaining to everyone a little bit about acres and then my talk doesn't have any of the lovely images of Corn Creek that you've seen all day. It's more about the screening process that we go through and kind of moving on from the life projects and what has been done to date. Um, so just to start off, So ACRES is the new agri-environment scheme in Ireland. So there's two streams to it. There's the general approach, which is a mix of prescriptive and results-based. And then that's available nationally. So farmers, similar to GLOSS, similar to REPS, they sign up, they select their actions, and they know exactly what money they're getting for the five years of the scheme and what actions they have to do. Then there's a new approach that's been um, rolled out by the Department of Agriculture, um, and that's the cooperation approach. So this is based in eight areas. Um, it's based mainly in SSEs, SPAs, and high water quality areas. Um, the department, farmers, and the advisors are supported by a local team. So for us in Acres West Connacht, we're responsible for two areas. We have Northwest Connacht, which includes Eris, and we also have South Mayo and Connemara. So we overlap with the majority of John's Corn Creek sites. Um, as someone mentioned this morning earlier as well, here in Eris, we have an awful lot going on. We have the Life on Macro project, we have the Corn Creek Life, we have the Great Yellow Bumblebee, and we have the cooperation areas within Acres as well. So the point of the cooperation areas is to have a locally led approach and um, focus more on what's happening in the local area. So for us in Acres West Connacht, we have broken those two zones into six more local manageable areas and there's a team of two local project officers assigned to each of those areas. So they liaise with the farmers, they liaise with the advisors in these areas to make sure the farmers and advisors are getting the, the best advice to, to deal with what's happening on their land. And I suppose that's one of the learnings that's come out of the EIPs and the life projects like Corn Creek Life, is that um, a one-size-fits-all approach doesn't work. Um, you know, there's so many different things going on. What's happening up in Donegal, and I'm sure John has found it in his sites, is very different than what's happening in Galway and Mayo, and we need to be able to adapt and fit in um, and react to those and help the farmers in these areas. So what's happening here in Eris, very different than what's happening in South Connemara. Um, our Carob mask area would be quite productive compared to here. So it's about tailoring the advice and the actions that you give farmers for these areas. So as I said, local project teams have been assigned to administer these, scheme, um, these eight priority areas. And two of the, of the key roles of the CP areas then is the development of a local action plan for each area and the screening and approval of non-productive investments. So these would be your support and actions. So with the local action plan, a local action plan has been each of the eight areas have a local action plan. And within that, you're looking at the um, qualifying interests of each area. Um, as I said, each site has a different um, issues, different habitats, different species to protect, and we need to make sure that we're focusing the advice and the actions on those. So, for example, in Eris, the Corn Creek, the Great Yellow Bumblebee, you have your Mac here systems. So they would be a priority for us to make sure that the actions that go in on these sites are suitable and they don't have a detrimental effect 
on um, these areas and these species. So part of our work with the cooperation project is liaison with other projects. So life and EIP projects that are active in our local areas and making sure that farmers are getting a consistent message from all teams. So like I'm not going out on Monday and giving on a farmer one bit of advice and John's not going out on Tuesday and saying something completely different. That the farmer is getting a consistent message um, because at the end of the day, we all have the same objectives and we all want to achieve the same goals. And it's just making sure that the farmer understands, you know, that he's not doing one thing in one scheme that's interacting differently in another scheme. So that's really important and that's really worked well, I think, between ourselves and Corn Creek Life. And the guys have also been very heavily involved in developing specifications and the guidance for the Corn Creek scorecard, as well as the Corn Creek specification, specific actions in acres. So the, with the national scheme, we don't have as much flexibility to kind of maneuver. So what's set um, in year one has to stay for the five years of a scheme. Whereas in the life projects, you have the ability to adapt and, and change as you go along through the project. So we're very lucky that John has done all the hard work for us on the action side of things, and we're now able to take those actions and put them straight into um, the, the CP areas and offer those to farmers in the CP areas. So again, keeping that consistency, but also ensuring that it is something that works um, for the farmers and for the species as well. So. The Life Project has also had a crucial role in the development and feedback process for this because, like I said, we have to, when you're working in a national scheme, it has to fit all um, kind of all different, different sides. Um, so being able to kind of liaise with John and his team on that and making sure that we get the best for the species and the habitats while making it fit within the specifications and the, the requirements for Europe um, has been important. So the farm actions then within the cooperation area, it um, follows a similar hybrid model to the life projects and the EIPs in that there's a results-based payment. So the farmer's main payment is results-based, their land gets scored, they get their main payment from that, and then there's actions that they can select to help improve their score going forward. So the non-productive investments and landscape actions are part of that action-based payment. It's an annually funded opportunity for farmers, so they can apply each year for a selection of actions that either have an environmental benefit or can help improve their score. Um, and the key feature, I suppose, is that they're targeted actions. So we're going to the right measure in the right place. It's not just looking at, oh, I'll put six bird boxes in there and I'll put 12 bird boxes in there. It's about is there uh, a need for these? So, for example, with our screening, if a farmer applies for a barn owl box, then we're looking at the distribution of barn owls and is there an actual habitat for, you know, is there a need for it in that area? And if it's not, we'd be recommended something else. So it's important, again, about managing the resources and making sure that they're targeted to the right, the right place and, and what's needed and making sure that there's no unintended negative impact on the environment as well from these actions. So with the screening of farm action, so this is a completely new approach to actions um, at a national level. So the eight CP regions have over 45,000 actions that were applied for. So each one of those actions have individually been screened. For us in Acres West Connacht, we've done just under 7,000 of those actions screened. So like I said, at a national level to review that in such detail um, is a major step. And it's something I think, you know, the department have taken a massive kind of step forward with and it's important that we keep this going and it's something that needs to be kind of done more, I think, of as well. So how then that we screen, how do we screen the actions? So the results-based data enables for us to target the farm actions um, and screen the environmental app impacts in an, in an approvals process. So some of the um, data that we have, we have the scorecard data that the advisors would have um, had on the farms last year. And then we're also looking at GIS data. So data available from the MPWS, data available from OSI, water courses, all of that is all taken and looked at as we screen each of the actions. 
and then there's a suggested decline or approval based on the characteristics of the action, and you're looking at the sensitivity of the receptor as well. So certain actions might not be suitable on a MACAR site, and we have to look at those um, and make sure we approve them. So that's just to give you an idea of the non-productive investments. They're available on the department website um, and the parcels that they can be selected on as well. So the screening process then looks at the appropriateness of the farm actions um, and looking at it from a legal point of view in terms of the habitat directives. So we're looking at all the SACs, SPAs, like I said, high water status bodies, and seeing if there's a risk from this action. So putting in a culvert on a drain um, that leads to a water course, is there a benefit to that or is there an, a risk from it? So some of the screening that we do can be done online through the GIS systems, through mapping, through um, looking at online data, and some of it does require farm visits as well, just to double check. So we also look at archeological heritage, water quality, and any other regionally or locally important environmentally assets. So like I said, in each area, there's gonna be something different that we're trying to protect or trying to improve on, and just making sure that we're capturing that as well within the screening process. So we have to make sure that it's available, um, the best available data we're using. So all the NPIs and landscape actions will be screened each year. So every time their window opens, um, the, pre the action is applied for, then it's sent from the Department of Agriculture to the CP teams. We go through the process of looking at each one individually and approving or declining it, and then that's fed back into the department system. So um, we needed something that standardise the rules because there's five different CP teams working in five very different regions in the country, um, but also making sure that we had flexibility to allow for site-specific um, characterizations, and like I said, using the best available data. So the process is um, the MPI are screened by the project team. Most are currently declined, so these tests give rise to a default, um, and the declines are highlighted. So then the project officer works farm by farm through each action and then they have to find the data. So the system will ask them for more data if it's not sure and they will have to go and find that data and double check. Um, and they review those failed tests and they either leave it as it is or they might have to override it. So for example, um, if you were putting in a gate and the scorecard had flagged invasive species, so that gate then would automatically decline because there's a risk of invasive species spread. The project officer might go out and have a look and the invasive species might be down the far corner of the field and no risk by putting that gate in. So they would override that decision then. So it's a partly automated system. So like I said, each action runs through 150 tests. Um, it's being checked by through AA um, and each single test, each single action has to run through each one of these tests. So there's two parts to the test. So for example, if you were doing a peatland habitat, um, you would look, you check the data source to make sure that the MPI is located on a peatland. Then um, if there was cause for concern, you would check the matrix to see if you could override it or leave it as it is. And then otherwise you um, put it to an approve. And then you check the rules matrix. So the rules matrix is made up of ones and zeros. So if it comes back as a one, there's an issue and it automatically goes to decline unless the project officer feels like it should be changed. If it's a no, then you can approve it. And again, they just go through each of those actions to make sure they're okay. So that is just the very complex screening process that goes on in the background of each of the tests. So like I said, each single action that we have, we have 52 actions. They each individually go through the 150 tests and come back with a one or zero, and then they're reviewed individually by a project officer. So some of the sample tests, so for archeology, span it would be um, flagged within 10 meters of a recorded monument, and you would look at GIS, so you would look at your mapping system to see if there was um, a monument um, 
within 10 metres of the action, um, and then you would you would go from there with that. The same with your negative indicators um, or your excluded habitats, and then you make the, the project officer makes the final decision then on whether they can pass or fail. So there's nine different sections within the screening database. Um, as I said, ones and zeros come back. We use scorecard data and farmer and advisor details as well. So if the um, we have all the information on the advisor so we can check with the advisor as well if there's something that's flagging up and we don't have time to go out and check in the, the field. So there's an approve, decline and get data and it only takes one test to decline an action. So all four, 149 tests could be fine and if there's one then it automatically declines the action. So again that means that the advisor or the project officer has to go in and double check it. Um, if a project officer decides to override a decision, then they have to provide data, whether that be um, photos or a field assessment sheet, and then that then is reviewed by the manager and signed off before it's sent to the department. So there's a two or three step process in place to ensure that all actions are properly screened. And then just to quickly go through the MPI screening database, it just shows default screening outcome under the nine themed items. Um, it highlights get missing data for actions. It allows the CP teams to change or override the default decisions. It stores and records the backing documents to support it. So in the case of any inspections or audits that we can show our, our, um, how we reach the point of that decision. It tracks who records the MPI screening and it locks the record. So once it's submitted to the Department of Agriculture, that record is then locked so changes can't be made to it after on our system. And then we use an online web map and additional environmental data sets as well so that we can double check. Um, and we can also record our geotagged photos within that as well. So challenges then and potential improvements. Um, quality and resolution of the data sources vary. So we use data from the MPWS, the Department of Agriculture, um, archaeological data sets. And certain tests can be run against crude da data sets, resulting in a lot of site visits and overrides happening at the moment. So the matrix will be updated following year one. Protocol will need to be um, revised and refined as well. So it is an evolving process. And like I said, this is the first year that this has been done on this scale, um, so we do need to improve it as we go along. Um, so I suppose just to say on the local action plan, um, that's really where the focus is on looking at the species and the NPI sent to make sure that they're targeted and the screening process. Um, so that's kind of what we're doing in the moving on from the life projects um, and looking at it on a more national level in terms of um, making sure that we identify potential habitats and actions that can suit the species in the, in the areas. So that's... Thanks, Mary. There's a lot of information in that, and this is going to be a really important area because there's so many projects coming in and overlaying with each other to make sure that things are done effectively and not... Um, <laughs> counterproductively, so it's going to be an important area to work on in future. Um, last but not certainly not least is the science bit, um, and Andrea Parisi is a PhD student working with Concrete Life at the ATU um, in Galway, and is researching the use of innovative technologies for concrete conservation, so Andrea. Thank you very much. I'm Andrea, I'm doing my PhD in ATU, uh, supervised by Joan O'Brien and James Moran as well. Uh, the title is Improving Conservation Status of Concrete Using Innovative Technologies. And I'm, did I just press OK, yeah? yeah. Um, so when we talk about innovative technologies, I... Is it clear? No? Uh, sorry. Uh, oh, like this, yeah, sorry. So innovative technologies are essentially passive acoustic monitoring and thermal imaging uh, applied to the case of the concrete. So when we talk, going into the passive acoustic monitoring part um, is basically the use of sonic or the sonic environment 
to analyze uh, life history and ecological traits of species of interest. Uh, there are essentially, essentially two branches. One is the use of mobile recorders to get high quality recordings of just one species um, to gather information as you will see, we'll see later. Or the use of um, static recorders to get a wide range of data to analyze um, uh, broader research questions. So um, why using passive acoustic monitoring? Essentially because we can gather long-term uh, monitoring data. We can detect species, for example, in the case of the concrete, when they are rare or they don't, or they don't call much, which is not the case of the concrete. Um, the disturbance and traveling is also reduced, so we don't, we don't have to um, um, cause disturbance, disturbance to the species of interest of us. And it's quite a cost effective as well if we want to, um, if it's well managed. On the other end, though, we have also some um, drawbacks. So species are hard to estimate, uh, for species are to estimate their abundance. Um, it's, it requires skills for deployment and also analysis. And there is the requirements of data storage because the files are huge, basically very heavy. It's also susceptible to weather, um, rain and wind, especially in Ireland, um, can impair the recording. Um, and if on one end is cost effective, on the other end is also uh, um, quite expensive considering the extras as well, like SD or batteries. So getting to the concrete calls, vocalizations 13 have been described so far in captivity mostly, three in the wild, and you are familiar with the broadcast call if you can play it. Thank you very much. It's very familiar with that. As a quite monotonic, repetitive structure. Um, we are maybe less familiar with the female calling. Um, if you can jump to the other panel, I think, yeah. Um, the structure is pretty much the same, and it sounds something like this. This is a recording from Andy Allard in Don Gold. Um, we also have the soft call, uh, which is a vocalization used probably by both male and females to communicate in a grass, which is not a great environment for um, visual clues. So it, they use com um, acoustics basically to communicate, and it sounds something, it's very faint, but it should be. It sounds like the concrete is dying, basically. Um, towards the end, there is another one. Yeah. Um, it's quite a low frequency sound, and uh, it's also very brief. Um, so. The question we wanted to answer was, can we track record, um, can we track concretes by using acoustics? Um, this was based on a paper from Peak uh, and others in, on the concrete vocal individuality. Um, the, the, the fact was that uh, we weren't really happy with the, with the, with the statement that concretes move, don't move farther than 250 meters during a season, uh, which is the assumption that surveys are based on basically. So we recorded concretes, uh, we gathered 101 recordings in two years, 39 in 22 and 62 in 23, using a parabolic microphone, which is basically uh, a device that conveys the sounds towards the center, where a high sensitivity microphone um, record high quality recordings. Um, so we could extract um, information from the calls. So this is a normal, like you saw before, it sounds, again, you can play it. Um, it sounds typical cold, and, and this is an amplitude and a waveform. It's like basically the measure of pressure uh, on the microphone. Um, if we uh, slow it down by half, it looks, so, it, is, it sounds something like this. And, and it's also looking like a series of drums or pulses. And if we slow it down 10 times and we zoom in even more, you can see uh, we, it's possible to measure, you can play it. Yeah. Uh, we can measure the distance between the pulses um, and get an idea on the identity of, the, of, the, of each, of each uh, calling mail. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, so what did we find? Um, using um, short-term movement, short-range movement, sorry, we found that in, within a season, birds move up to 1.8 kilometers, uh, 1.6 in that case, or 1.3. And on average, if you go on the, on, the, on the line as well, we show the average. Um, on average, they move basically 450 meters within a season. So more than we thought. 
Um, for the between year movements, instead, um, so most, some birds were moving as far as 1.2 kilometers for, in four cases. Um, on average, although on average, it was uh, 375. So um, that was interesting, but we didn't stop there. We wanted to look at the landscape features that facilitated or hinder this movement. So we extracted three uh, landscape feature configuration features from a buffer between two calling locations. And we extracted connectivity, uh, the amount of semi-natural grassland, SNG, um, which is based essentially the suitable habitat for the concrete, and the uh, amount of margin feature, which were ditches, hedgerows, or scrubs as well, that are used by concretes to move through uh, the landscape. What we found is that connectivity has a negative effect on the movement, surprisingly. Um, Semi-natural grassland has had a positive effect. Um, for these two were the seasonal movement, so within a season, um, concrete moved farther in habitat uh, with good um, semi-natural grassland, which is not surprising. Um, for the between-year movements, instead birds occurred farther away when the margin feature were, um, were, were abandoned, basically. So essential implications for this, uh, males move farther than 400 meters, um, and together, and some features in the landscape, such as semi-natural grassland, and the margins facilitate movements. Um, together with this paper that states that fledglings move farther than 800 meters from the father of colony locations, we suggest to you increase the habitat management buffer to 500 meters and not 250 meters anymore, uh, what, something we were talking about earlier this morning. Um, and that was that for the use of mobile recorders. If you remember then, passive acoustic monitoring entails as well the use of um, um, passive reco uh, pass static recorders. So we deployed, 20, uh, we, re we deployed 20 these recorders at 26 co breeding, concrete breeding locations. Um, and in 2022, we gathered something, collected something, 24,000 24, hours of recordings, um, which accounts to something three years of data, pretty much, um, in Mayo and in Donegal as well. So the first question we wanted to answer uh, was, is, is still ongoing uh, through a master student, uh, Marie Graney, um, which was, when to survey concretes. In other words, we were interested in what factors affect the calling of the concretes. So we extracted the calls from the long-term recordings and related the calling rate to uh, some uh, factors such as temperature, wind speed, moon illumination, hour, and uh, time of the year as well, and date, essentially. Um, so what we found, uh, I'm not gonna go farther in much into this, but just quickly touch some results. Uh, as we were expecting, there is a peak between midnight and 3 a.m. Uh, of the concrete cooling, uh, which then tends to decline and level off during the daylight. Uh, and after 8 p.m., it rises again, so it's not a news, but we suggest to carry out the sur concrete surveys between midnight and 3 a.m. The interesting thing, we, there is a negative relationship between calling rate and the wind speed. So you can see until 10 kilometers an hour, the calling rate is unbothered pretty much. But after such a threshold, the, the calling rate of the Congress tends to, um, tends to decrease quite a lot. So we know it's not easy in Ireland to find uh, nights where the wind is less than 30 kilometers an hour, but if you can avoid over 10 kilometers an hour, basically it's going to increase your chances to hear a concrete. I don't know how it's gonna be tonight, but I'm pretty sure it should be better than that. Um, I'm not going to go further in, on this, as I said, so I'm gonna to move to the, the other use of the static recorders we do, which is called soundscape ecology. The aim is, our aim was to provide um, a protocol for analysis and extraction in, in places where the weather can affect a lot the recordings, like in Ireland, with loads of rain and, rain and, and wind, as we were saying, and explore the relationship of the sound, sonic environment with the landscape. In other words, again, the broader question was, can we sample biodiversity just by listening to the recordings? Um, so, 
<laughs> basics, uh, basically. Um, biophony, uh, there are three components in your soundscape. One of them is biophony, which sounds something like this, and it looks something like this. So you get the sound between three and 10 uh, kilohertz, essentially. Um, you can stop the recording and move to the other tab. Then there is geophony, which is the sound of the earth, and it comes tends to mask, you can play, yeah. And it sounds something like this and can mask effectively all the biological sounds. Um, and then we get... That's very loud. Um, then we get anthrop anthropophony, which is the human-generated noise, and it can um, mask bio the basically the bird sounds and, and, and all the biological sounds. Um, you can play it and put it maybe towards the half, half length, should be. Um, you can, yeah. You don't know what it sounds like. Um, that's it. So, basically, how do we describe, um, how do we describe this diversity in the soundscape? That was the broader question. Um, you can see here, there is a concrete, for example, calling here. There is an airplane passing by. Um, there, is the, there are the waves at the base here and other birds chirping around. So scientists, bioacousticians came up with the, what are called acoustic indices which, which, that can describe the diverse, the, this diversity of sources within the soundscape. Um, some indices are, for example, measuring the, bio, the amount of biological sounds, like the bioacoustic index. Some of them the, uh, measure the diversity of signals, so like the diversity index. Some others that describe the ratio between biophony and anthropophony, uh, such as the signal to noise ratio. So we used a suit of Augustine indices and extracted, again, landscape feature around the recorder. Um, these landscape features were essentially natural area, so the amount of grassland um, as a proxy of biodiversity, and also the landscape diversity, uh, which is basically a proxy for heterogeneity in the habitat, in the, in the landscape, um, and also plus hour and date um, um, when we extracted these indices. So briefly as well, how we, what did we find? On a positive relationship between the bioacoustic index and the natural area, meaning that it can be effectively used as an indicator of biodiversity, this index. Um, so the sonic, the diversity in the, son, the the amount of biological sound relates to the amount of um, biodiversity in the visual environment. Interestingly as well, we found that the acoustic diversity index is positively correlated with the landscape diversity. So the diversity in the sonic environment is also uh, reflected in the visual, uh, in the visual world, um, visual perspectives. Uh, a couple of patterns like the complexity index, um, it goes up uh, during the dawn choruses hour, levels down uh, around the afternoon, and then goes down during the night. There is no much complexity during the night. There is lots of complexity during the dawn choruses hours. Um, here is the number of sonic events, just any event. Um, so here is our retro, May, June, July. You can see there is a nice pattern where in May, when most of the birds are vocalizing, uh, the index value goes up, whereas uh, in July, when most of the birds completed the clutches uh, and most of the ecosystem goes quiet, uh, the, the, the values are quite low. So <clears throat> the relevance to use uh, soundscape ecology is, um, imagine you walk in a f most of the scorecards or the habitat assessment we do are based on the visual world um, with very little um, weight on the sonic perspective, but there is actually a relationship between the two. So it's, it's, it would be useful to include this for a long-term monitoring of the sites instead of just walking in the field and in those 30 minutes assess the habitat. That's great, thank you. Um, and there is, there is scope to, to inform uh, the concrete life outputs pretty much. Quickly, because I don't have much time, um, thermal imaging. We wanted to test thermal imaging as a tool uh, for conserving concrete, so basically detect nests and females and adults as well on the, on the, in the grass. Um, we carried out two experiments, one in captivity and the other one in the wild, semi-captivity, I'd say. 
So we had a concrete and a gray partridge. Um, we carried out five flights, plus a sun, including a sunrise trial as well in uh, nesting habitat. If you can circle this concrete there, yeah. Um, that's it, yeah, it's fine. Oh, if you, you can activate the, the pen over there, yeah, that's it. Um, so uh, here is the concrete at 20 meters uh, in sparse habitat. It wasn't proper nesting, nesting habitat. Instead, here is a gray partridge during the sunrise, tri sunrise trial. Um, you can see, we, we can say they are birds, but we can't say they are concretes or gray, gray partridge, basically. So we wanted to have a look at uh, what happens in the wild. We carried out an experiment. You, can you just disable there? Sorry, <laughs> in the corner. Yeah, that's it. So we carried out uh, um, a trial in the wild uh, in July last year, between 9, 9 p.m. and 2 a.m. with four flights. Uh, we didn't detect any, con we detected a concrete, but it was moving through the vegetation quite quickly, and we lost it pretty much immediately. Um, so we didn't get our, the results we wanted, but we are positive about our negative note. Um, anyway, we know the low detectability was due to certain things like the flight height wasn't right, uh, the concrete behavior, which is very elusive, it tends to um, find shelter very quickly uh, when there is the noise of the drone overhead. The size and physiology as well, because it's so small and so well insulated that the thermal signature is not very good. Um, breeding ecology as well, because they, they nest in tunnels pretty much, and the, the layer of vegetation, do, they don't let the, the thermal uh, imager to, to detect the signal. Some experimental conditions may have affected as well, like the, the dew drops on the vegetation may have transferred on the, on the back of the bird, um, hampering the, the, the signal detection. So our output is going to be just guidelines for future um, thermal imaging experiment. Um, for ground nesting species and concrete in general, and hopefully other researchers might use them as well. And I think that is that. Thank you. Good timing. We've got two minutes for questions. So, uh, actually, we might have a little more. One second. Let me see. Uh, yeah, two minutes for questions. I'm afraid. Uh, Barry. Thanks very much. Um, so Barry is my name. I work with the National Parks and Wildlife Service. And my question is for the, the French boys, uh, for Thibault and Ryan. And it goes back to the point in terms of um, looking at power and conservation on, on an international scale. Um, so we've always been tr interested in the situation in France. And when we were putting together this project, we got the idea for the scare bears here. So thanks to, to Fran France for that idea. Um, so. If you're looking at France on the migration route, you're talking about 800 kilometers of territory, and it seems if you are down to just 100 pairs that it's not a very um, friendly environment, I guess, for the corn crakes nowadays. Um, so with that in mind, I just had two, uh, two key questions, and it was both relating to people, because that's what conservation is all about. Um, one, in terms of the, the social aspect, um, in the area, in particular Angers, where there's maybe 50% or 70% of the population, um, I'm interested to know what the age profile, the demographics of the people are there. Um, maybe you could answer that first. Is it aging population? I know, I know in France that you've lost like 20% of your farmland and farmers in, in the last decade. So if you're losing people managing the land, what's going to happen? Yeah, it's, quite, it's like 50, 60 year old people, mainly for farmers. So it will be renewing, renewing in a few few time. But it's like, it's a quite old, like people have been there for quite a lot of time. And uh, yeah, it's changing their minds is quite difficult. So yeah, maybe that's why we're struggling a bit with the farmers out there around Angers, for example. Are, are you seeing farmers being lost from the area? Uh, not really. Okay. Oh. 
Yeah, yeah, farms are getting quite bigger. They're not going to disappear. It's gonna, they're going to stay around Angers. It's just like the, uh, the things are going to change around Angers, maybe. But, or there will always be farmers in around the, in the best valley, Angevin. It's low getting bigger and more intensive. Yeah, so. that's it. Yeah. And um, just on the same spectrum, I guess, then, from a political point of view, obviously, the protests in France uh, has precipitated a lot of uh, changes, I guess, in terms of environmental restrictions yeah. as they're yeah, seen. Yeah. Is that something that will make con concrete conservation more difficult? Yeah, we think so. We haven't got the, the like, we, we don't really know how it's going to act, but we're sure that it's going to have a, um, quite a big effect with all the like, restrictions that have farmers have, or even the money that was that's going to put in the agricultural, agricultural schemes. So but we don't know yet what's going what's gonna to happen. But yeah. For sure, there's going to be some some things that are going to be great for concrete. Thanks, for, thanks, yeah. Ryan. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks both. Uh, that's all we've got time for. Sean, if you if you've got questions, anybody else got questions, pick them up with the speakers directly over the break, uh, or we might have a bit of time at the end of the day, and I'll try and build that in. That's okay. Um, can I've got three things to ask. Um, Firstly, all speakers in the next session, if you could just hang back for one minute, I just want a quick word with you. It's going to be a rapid fire session next. We need to be well planned. Um, anyone staying for dinner tonight, please pre order with Mary at reception. It's essential. Give the kitchen a chance to make your food on time or you'll be hungry. Um, and then please be back in your seats by 10 to 10 to uh, whatever that is, 10 to 4. Yes, 10 to 4. Uh, be back in your seats by then, please. That'd be great. Thank you very much, all.